Today we're here at Duxbury High School comparing 1980s DHS to now on another segment of This Duxbury Life. Hi, I'm Michelle Meyer and I will be comparing and contrasting substance abuse from the 1980s to now. Hi, I'm Ginny Wyatt, covering the culture of the high school. Hi, I'm Kara Vetch, and I'll be reporting first on the comparisons of colleges of Duxbury students attending from 1980s to now. For almost every student in Duxbury, the assumed next step after high school is college. College. That seven-letter word that both excites and terrifies all students. Attending it is what we all strive for throughout our education, seeing it as a light at the, t- at the end of this seemingly endless tunnel known as school. Most of us say that we are going far away at some point, pledging to leave this place behind and to make a name for ourselves. However, as time goes on, most end up going to colleges that are closer to home, whether it be because of money, quality of education, or simply to be closer to home. Such has been the case for many years. Looking at where students went to college in the 1980s compared to now, one sees some stark similarities and differences. As a whole, most Duxbury High School students go to different schools and clusters. There are always one or two students at some random colleges around the country, but a lot also go to the same general schools together. In the 1980s, as found by consulting the Duxbury Clippers from the 80s, students went to a lot of local schools, as they do now. Some went to Bryant University, just as some are going this year. Many went to Stonehill, same as today, with 12 currently attending. However, there are some distortions between the two. In the 1980s, fewer students attended the University of Massachusetts schools, with 20 students enrolling this year alone. At the other end of the spectrum, few students ventured out of New England in the 1980s, with more today, but still disproportionate to New England attendance. Also, today some students are venturing to schools farther away, such as University of Alabama, with five going this year alone. But most are going in clusters to schools like this. At the elite colleges, Duxbury students were, and are still represented relatively well, with at least a few Duxbury students at Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, Columbia, MIT, and Brown. Overall, some things have changed while some stay the same, but altogether, the college process and its toughness reunites us all. From 1984 to 1985, there were several fatal accidents caused by drunk student drivers. A survey done by the Dragonflyer found that 49% of the student body drank. This is lower than the 51% state average at the time. However, Duxbury students were not only drinking, but drinking and driving. On December 23, 1984, Mary and Brett Barclay, two Duxbury High School seniors, were killed in a crash. The driver, Patrick Sheehan, suffered mild injuries. Sheehan was later charged with vehicular homicide and operating a vehicle while under the influence of alcohol. In September, the class of 85 lost its third member as a result of driving under the influence. 17-year-old Tracy Arsenal died due to injuries she received in a car accident. The driver, Roseanne McKinry, was treated for minor injuries at Jordan Hospital. McKinry was also charged with operating under the influence. Both accidents required the police to use the jaws of life and occurred past 11 at night. After the accidents, the Duxbury community held multiple seminars against drinking and driving. Duxbury students got involved in spreading the word, and SAD, Students Against Drunk Drivers, recruited new members left and right. Today, we are still spreading the word. We honor the three seniors that did not graduate with their class in 1985 by being aware of the risks we take when we step behind the wheel intoxicated. Seminars are given to students and parents prom night about making good choices. SAD changed its name to Students Against Destructive Decisions, and the number of student OUIs has decreased dramatically. Kids are still getting in trouble for drinking at parties and abusing drugs. However, students are now more hesitant to get behind the wheel under the influence. This is due in part to the seminars, advertisements on TV, and a general awareness of the consequences. In the 1980s, Duxbury was very much a party-oriented high school. As previously mentioned, there were a number of student car crashes due to drinking and driving. House parties were consistently broken up by the police. However, the same Massachusetts Intercollegiate Athletic Association, or MIAA, had consequences for possession or association with substance that were not in place in the time of the 1980s. 
The interactions with the police were usually warnings and had little punishment attached to them. This thief is very much unlike today, as many people were recently suspended off of sports teams and extracurriculars such as National Honor Society due to the parties being broken up. Lack of consequence led to a party culture dominating the scene. Kids were constantly bombarded with programs trying to curb the substance abuse, such as Students Against Drunk Driving and Dialogue Day. This is parallel to the programs that students are faced with today, both in advisory, elements of the prom contract, and various public speakers that are hired to deliver a similar message. Whether these programs helped or not, they were definitely present. Furthermore, earlier this year, Mr. Stevens personally told me that talk of lengthening the Spirit Week would never have even been thought of then due to the number of students who used to show up intoxicated to the pep rallies. In line with the work hard, play hard mantra, the majority of DHS students went to college in the 1980s and SATs were 20% above the national average. Today, our proficiency in English is 100%, math 99%, and the participant passing rate of AP exams stands at 81%, one of the highest in the country. Education remained consistent with its quality from 1980s to now. For extracurriculars, sports, drama, and clubs were the common themes. For sports, Duxbury was credited with two Olympic athletes alumni in the 1980s and one in the 2000s. In 1980 through 1986, cross country won the league championships, and the girls won an additional title in 1982. This is very much like this is very much unlike the boys cross country team of today. The two main programs today are football and lacrosse. However, back then, it was mainly football and cross country. Football now spans from 2001 to 2005, receiving league championships. However, in the 1980s, only 85 and 88 received the league championships. Similarly, today, 2005, 2008, 2010, and 2011, all were awarded with state championships. On the other hand, boys lacrosse had a championship in both 2000 to 2009, a nine-year span of titles. Before then, the lacrosse program had not been created, and Mr. Sweet was the original founder. Girls lacrosse had the similar theme, with championships in both 2007 and 2009. The upswing of sports can be accredited to an alumni association giving more money to coaches and teams. However, on another note, drama was in the upswing as well. A hundred were in attendance then, and only 50 are in attendance now. From 1980 to 1989, every year they went to state's final competition. On another much somber note, there was almost an AIDS policy passed due to the AIDS and homosexuality topic being spread nationwide. Homosexuality was a very much different topic than it is now. In conclusion, the building was in a much better shape and the culture was very much segregated by interest as opposed to today. With a new school and new traditions to be made, we look forward to seeing what it can offer to the cultural hub of Duxbury. Thanks for listening in to another segment of This Duxbury Life. Tune in next time and have a great afternoon.